It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is His Excellency Kamil Abdul Rahim, Egyptian ambassador to the United States. Mr. Ambassador, our viewers are tremendously interested in the great political struggle now going on in the Middle East. And you, sir, with your long and distinguished career in the Egyptian diplomatic service, are particularly well qualified to give us some authoritative information. Now, first of all, sir, your country and Britain have just reached an important agreement over that great area called the Sudan. It's about a third the size of the United States. Now, sir, will you tell our viewers first uh, just what the significance of this agreement is over the Sudan? This agreement on the Sudan is one of the most important events and one of the perhaps the only happy news that we have received for a long long time in the Middle East. What does Egypt gain out of the agreement? Well we we gain only solving a long-standing problem. Sudanese have been given the right to self-determination either to unite with Egypt or to be independent. In other words, in about uh, three or four years from now, the Sudanese, that, uh, that, that's almost, uh, that's a third the size of the United States, that great area will choose to be either independent or to become a part of Egypt. Is that correct, sir? Yes, in three years they will have full self-government and they will be either choose to be now, independent. Now, has, has this agreement uh, uh, eased the tensions between the West and Egypt? Has it made Egypt perhaps friendlier toward Britain and the United States? I think it has eased the conditions uh, tremendously and it's only, not only that, but I think it paved the way for a final and uh, a final solution well, for the they, Suez problem. If the, uh, if the Sudanese uh, do decide after this three-year period to become independent, what does it mean economically and a loss to Egypt? Does it mean some economic loss? Uh, not at all. There is no economic loss at all, except that we only united with the uh, with the Sudan by the River Nile, which is the life giver of both countries. Well, does it mean any loss to the British economically? Because the British get quite a good deal of cotton from the uh, Sudan, I understand. Well, they get the cotton everywhere now, from the United States, from Peru, from everywhere, and no more now. There's a great shortage of cotton. We want to sell our cotton, but it is, we find some difficulty. What would, what would be the reaction in Egypt if, after this three-year period, the uh, Sudanese decided to join up with the British? Well, I really don't know if they're going to do that. I think this is a, a very, uh, a very academic question, and uh, the British themselves, they do not feel as the Sudanese is going to join the Commonwealth. Well, but they have the right to do that if they want to. Well, if they years. are independent. Well, well, sir. Now that you've gotten over this first hurdle, the Sudanese hurdle, this week you began uh, conversations with the British over that thorny problem of. British troops leaving the Suez, and of course Britain has about 50,000 troops there. Now your country wants those 50,000 British troops to leave, doesn't it? Well, surely, because this, these troops have been in Egypt since 1882, and they came by force, and they still remain there in the when, Suez camp. When do your negotiations start for... Uh, well, we're hoping to negotiate very soon, perhaps, uh, perhaps this week, do we you hope think, so. Do you think that the agreement, would you make any predictions as to how it might come out, that the agreement will be that the well, British if, troops will uh, leave the Well, if the agreement on the Suez Canal is negotiated on the, on the same spirit that we negotiated the Sudanese question, I have great hopes and I'm very optimistic of the result. Well, you want the British to leave and then does Egypt want to take over, assume the sole responsibility for the protection of the Suez area? Of course, we, we are ready to assume the sole responsibility for the Suez area. We have a, an army of 100,000. We need some equipment, 
with this equipment, we could be ready to, to defend our country. Well, and well, I can assure you, the, 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 the country <coughs> can and defend its territory better than any other foreigners. Do you plan to expand your military power in Egypt? Well, this is limited to our <coughs> possibilities of budget and so forth, but you know, we, our population is 21 million inhabitants. We could raise up to one million soldiers. Well, that brings us to perhaps the most interesting point, sir. Here in America, our policy for a long time has been to expand the military power in the Middle East. The Middle East is a power vacuum. It's an immensely rich area, 60% of the oil reserves of the earth. And we, of course, as we as an American nation, we want to create a powerful military force in the Middle East, and we want it to be Egypt. Now, first of all, sir, you've said that your country with 21 million people, you can support an army of a million people, can't you? We can support, but you know, the, 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 the expenses of a no, new right. army I mean, you, is Well, so you, can, you can supply <laughs> the manpower. For we such can a supply the manpower, and we could, uh, we could, through our budget, also help in uh, defraying the expenses. And Mr. Some Ambassador, of the expenses. Do you see any signs that American policy will be to equip your troops with arms if you expand your armed forces? Well, I really can't speak uh, to, uh, on the uh, American policy, but... I say, do you uh, see any signs that that might happen? Well, if, uh, if, if the United States finds it for its interest that we'll have a strong Egypt, well-equipped, as they ha found for its interest to have a strong Turkey, well-equipped in the northeastern well, Mediterranean... Egypt would like to have that kind of aid, though. Well, we are ready to have this aid, no doubt about it. Well, it's, I believe it's the announced policy of our State Department now that we want, to, we want to help create such power as you suggest. And the questions that are in our viewers' minds, I think, are these. First of all, uh, how dependable would a strong uh, Euro uh, Egypt be in the conflict between the West and Russia? Would you be a dependable ally? We have been always dependable during the last two <laughs> world wars. In the First World War, we rendered the great service to our friends, the Western powers. Of course, I suppose. In the last yeah. world war, we did the same thing. I don't find anything to, to the contrary for any future war. Your, your primary need is airplanes and tanks, I assume. Airplanes and tanks and anti-air defense. This is a difficult question to ask you because you can't answer it but one way that I can see, but do you think that the Egyptians are mechanically, do they have mechanical abilities to handle this technical equipment, the average Egyptian soldier? The, the British uh, Suez base is mainly run <coughs> by, Egyptian, by Egyptian mechanics. And they have a special capacity in mechanics there, and they will can find the people there who could do the, this job very well, easily. Mr. Ambassador, just looking ahead a little bit, suppose you have your army of a million, and suppose they're equipped and supplied by the Americans, and maybe you get your training, some of your help in that way. Is there any chance at all of uh, these, this big armed force being used aggressively against Israel? I don't think there is any, any chance at all of that sort, because we need the army for our defense for the defense of our country. And we have no aggressive intentions whatsoever against anybody. And uh, you know that in 1950, there is a joint declaration of France, uh, Britain, and the United States guaranteeing the, the, the whole status quo there, and nobody could attack the other. Well, one of the things uh, most Americans are, are, are proud of how Turkey has developed as a military power in that area. Uh, we, we feel that we've gotten more for our money in Turkey than anywhere else, and we feel that the Turkish armored divisions are the best ones facing Russia. Now, do you think that a, an armed uh, Egypt could cooperate with Turkey in that area, or are you an ancient enemy of the Turks? Now, <coughs> no, we are not ancient enemies. We are tied and allied always with the, with the Turks, and uh, we're ready to cooperate with our <coughs> friends, we call them our cousins, the Turks, because there's a strong relations between Egypt and the Turkey for long how are, how are your relations with Russia today in Egypt? Uh, are they better or worse than they were, say, a year or two ago? Well, I think the same relations with all countries. We, we well, coming back to the Turks, sir, the Turkish plan, uh, where they <laughs> used the dictatorship uh, of Ataturk after the first war, and then they finally evolved into a relatively free nation. 
Now, do you think you see Egypt evolving somewhat on the Turkish plan? Do you see this dictatorship now and perhaps uh, becoming a free nation in three or four years from now? As a matter of fact, we, ask, we have now in Egypt started on the way of, of, of a real democracy. We have a, 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 a committee now you know, discussing the principles of a modern constitution for Egypt. And we have now a provisional constitution for Egypt in which is governed. And we hope after this period of transition, we will have a, a full parliament and a, a, a modern constitution. Well, sir, now as a, as a final question, uh, Egypt has always been a land of cruel extremes, great, we great wealth uh, for a few, and then uh, uh, the perhaps the oldest and poorest peasantry in the world. And you have now begun, I believe, the first land reform in, in the Middle East. As a final question, sir, uh, will you tell our viewers how that land reform is progressing? Well, this land reform is progressing very quickly, and Today, if you go to Egypt, you will find a new look in Egypt. You will find that there is a creating a new middle class of 8 million people, uh, higher wages for agricultural laborers, landless peasants are receiving lots of from 3 to 5 acres, <coughs> those who lease the land are receiving lower rents. So the result that you will have a higher standard of living for at least 8 million people in the country with a internal economic conditions and consumers' goods and better trade and industry inside the country. Well, well, thank you, sir, very much for being with us this evening. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was His Excellency Kamil Abdul Rahim, Egyptian ambassador to the United States. A priceless attribute of every Longines watch is the pride of possession which it brings to its possessor. And every owner of a Longines watch knows exactly what I mean. The Longines watch brings you more than the delight of a beautiful possession, more than the unsurpassed timekeeping of a remarkable watch. You have the pleasure of knowing that you own the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of the world. Longines is the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Truly, when you own a Longines watch, you know that it is, in fact, the world's most honored watch. So, when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as a gift, remember these facts. And remember, too, that if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. And you should insist on getting a Longines the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Wetnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Wetnor Watches. Wednesday nights, the big fights on the CBS television network.